Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture we read just a few moments ago out of the book of Exodus. We're looking at Exodus chapter 9. Today, the Lord willing, verses 13 through 35, although you probably note that's a rather long passage that we read this morning. God gave 23 verses to the plague of hail. He only gave six or seven verses to some of the other plagues, but he gave 23 to the plague of hail, just like he gave a huge amount of space to the plague of flies. When God gives you a lot of verses on a particular subject, and we'll see that the plague of hail is mentioned in many other portions of scripture, many places in the Old Testament prophets, it's also mentioned in the New Testament. We'll be looking at those as we get farther along, but take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of text in Exodus chapter 9. I have entitled the message, Hail to the Chief. No offense to uh, whoever wrote that stage right entrance music for the president. I hope that the time we're through that you'll be able to list all of the ten plagues in order from memory. So after our habitual interruptions, it seems uh, <laughs> we can't ever go more than two or three weeks at a time on the plagues. Uh, we're back on track today. What have we done so far? We've done blood, the plague of blood. We've done the plague of frogs. We've done the plague of lice. We've done the plague of flies. We've done the plague of murrain or the cattle plague. And we've done the boils. Now, I hope you can remember as long as three weeks ago, I gave you a way to remember those first six plagues in order. Sort of what, remember I talked about what a budak is? How many of you remember me talking about budaks? Okay, good, good. You remember the budaks? Budak is where you take like the first letter or first couple letters of a word and then you make a, a, a long word or a phrase out of it and that way it helps you remember everything in order. So we've got blow fro, that's blood and frogs, lie fly for lice and flies, and moo bow for murrain and boils, or moo also sounds like a cow. So it's blow fro, lie fly, moo bow. And we saw that boils three weeks ago, June 7th. Then two weeks ago, June 14th, summer youth rally. More viable than many sparrows. And then Father's Day last Sunday, what should a father teach his sons? And we talked about how there's some good lessons for daughters in what a father teaches his son. And that brings us back now to the plague of the hail. And we've just read about that. And for our overview, you remember we went through each of the different ten plagues and the specific God of Egypt that was being judged by Jehovah in that particular plague. The one that we're looking at today is the Egyptian God Shu, H-H-U, the God of the atmosphere. That's the God that's being judged with the plague of the hail. And as we looked at those lists of God, it established for us several basic principles that we can always rely on. Number one, God never changes his message. You'll notice how each one of the plagues is introduced. Thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. It's the same message at every step of the way. God never changes his word. He never changes his commands. He never compromises and enters into negotiations. What God says is what God means, and he means it the first time that he says it. I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. They can thank God for the promises that he gave them. That's Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. And that also brought us to a second lesson about the immutability of God. If God tells you to do something, he will crush you until you do it. His rod gets more and more severe until you obey. Pharaoh had to learn that the hard way. He was not among God's elect, and as a result, he was crushed. We saw that out of Romans chapter 9, verses 17 and 18. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. God raised Pharaoh up specifically so that he could crush him. Pharaoh was not among the elect. That quote that I just read you out of Romans 9, 17 is actually in our text today. I hope you noticed that as I read through that passage in Exodus. That is a quotation out of Exodus 9, 16. And in very deed, for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. What we've seen so far as we've looked at Pharaoh in Egypt is that 
The Bible consistently portrays Pharaoh as an illustration, a type, or a picture of two things. Number one, non-elect, degenerate leaders who are in rebellion against God. And number two, Satan. Pharaoh is used as a picture of unregenerate leaders in rebellion against God. And Pharaoh is a picture of Satan in multiple places in Scripture. The second thing we learned is the Bible consistently portrays the nation of Egypt as an illustration or a picture or a type of the rebellious world under the control of Satan and its degenerate leaders. Oh, we could stop here and preach a political sermon at this point, but we'll not. So as we look back at the plague of boils, which was the last plague that we looked at, that plague of cattle murrain, that was a judgment on the economic wealth of Egypt. Money and material possessions have always been a big false god in every one of the cultures. In ancient Middle Eastern agricultural societies, the principal source of wealth was the domesticated animals. The animals were not only necessary for food, but they were also necessary for all the labor of the field. The bulk of the labor was done by horses and oxen and donkeys and camels, and those are all listed as animals that God wiped them out. By contrast, you recall, when we looked at boils, we noted on June 7th that we live in more of an information age by which wealth is transferred electronically. We talked about the possibility of having an EMP, that's an electromagnetic pulse bomb, explode over the United States. That would wipe out all computers and equipment that rely on electricity by taking down the U.S. power grid. Economically, that would wipe out all the electronically stored financial data. It would eliminate your bank account. It would make you dead broke overnight. Today, before we go on to the plague of hail, I want to add some things to what I already said because I believe, in light of last week, that we're on the cusp of God's judgment. I think that God gave us a little taste of it in light of the shocking, though expected, Supreme Court decision that was handed down last week. I want to say just one thing about that and then move on. Learn to think biblically. You've probably heard over and over, and a comment to this effect was also included in Chief Justice Roberts' dissent, that five lawyers overturned the will of millions of people. And this is not democracy, and it's a violation of the Constitution. You all heard that from some commentator someplace, and it's in the Chief Justice's dissent. While that may be true, it's starting with the wrong premises and ultimately is the wrong form of reasoning. What if 95% of the people voted for homosexual marriage and five lawyers came down on the side of heterosexual marriage? That is, the five Supreme Court justices who are all lawyers. What if the justices just threw up their hands and said, let's call a general election, let everybody vote on the issue? And what if in that case 51% voted in favor of gay marriage? Would the majority, therefore, make it right? You see, the issue is not majority vote. The issue is not judicial activism. Genuine truth has never been determined by a majority vote or by judicial activism. You know, over the last several years, I have felt very uncomfortable in the entire debate whenever conservative Christians have used the argument that the majority of voters were in favor of traditional marriage. Because, you see, that's the wrong question, and it's the wrong place to start. The place to start on every moral issue is what is right and what is wrong. Because that leads to two more foundational questions. Number one, what is the standard for right and wrong? And number two, who determines the standards. If man determines the standards, everything's up for grabs and there are no absolutes. But if there is a creator God who made man, God determines the standards. That's why you hear me preaching so hard and furiously on the doctrine of fiat ex nihilo creationism, that is, he made it out of nothing, creationism, and why that is so absolutely essential, and why our culture today is at the crossroads it's at, is because the Christians have not taken a stand on creationism and explained it to their children and made an impact on their culture with it, then as a result, 
Young people, after they get through high school, tend to just sort of float off into Lulu land because, after all, if there's no creator God, there are no standards. If there are no standards, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to believe that stuff. I can live as immorally as I want to live. That brings us to the next set of questions. If there's a creator God who made man, has he revealed his standards? And if so, where has he revealed his standards? And that gets into the threefold evidence that God has given to us in Romans chapters 1 through 3. God has given revelation to man in three areas. Number one, through creation, Romans 1. Number two, through conscience, Romans 2. And number three, through the Bible, Romans chapter 3. So don't argue the issues such as gay marriage and other moral issues on the basis of popular vote. It's a very dangerous and deadly way to argue because you may lose the popular vote sometime. You see, men change, votes change, people are always getting more and more degenerate. Start with the right questions and the right premises and don't be ashamed to say, thus saith the Lord. As you see with Pharaoh, men will reject that approach, but that doesn't matter. Moses stood before Pharaoh and said, thus saith the Lord, and Pharaoh rejected it over and over and over and over. It doesn't matter because God is still on the throne. Our job is to say what God says. Yeah, they'll laugh at you. Yeah, they'll scoff you. Yeah, they'll oppose you. There will be those who stand against you like the magicians Jonathan Jambres did in Pharaoh's court, stood against Moses. Pharaoh rejected the truth, and it's still true, but the only place to be safe from the judgments of God is, we might say figuratively, the land of Goshen. Standing with the people of God, Goshen experienced a little trouble at the beginning of the plagues, but when the heavy plagues hit, Goshen was exempt. Just like the body of Christ will be exempt from the great tribulation after the rapture. So what was the taste of God's judgment? I mentioned this to begin this. What was the taste of God's judgment we saw last week? Well, we had a small example of power outages last week with the tornado that wiped out several power generating stations. And some of you lost a lot of frozen food and some of you had no air conditioning. Inconvenient, but not unlivable. The man's lost power for a day, but the church still had power. Some of you have jobs where your buildings lost power. Now think back to Egypt and think about this. Imagine what would happen to your job if you had no power for a year. What would happen to you in your job if you had no power for a year? We saw that an EMP would also wipe out all the electrical systems in automobiles, trucks, tractors, boats, airplanes, other motorized vehicles. And we asked the question so far, how far can you walk? It wouldn't make any difference if your grocery store was close to your house because the grocery store you rely on won't have any food because there'll be nowhere to transport the food to the stores and there won't be any way to manufacture the raw food into food products or get it from the farms to the plants where it's produced. Did you know that the threat of an EMP is so great that right now the U.S. is moving the headquarters for the North American Aerospace Defense Command, also known as NORAD, back underground into Cheyenne Mountain near Colorado Springs? That's going on right now. Let me read you just part of an article from the Wall Street Journal dated May 1st, just two months ago. The article was written, not written by a lunatic fringe junior reporter. It was written by Ambassador Henry F. Cooper, the former director of the Strategic Defense Initiative, and Peter Vincent Pry, the executive director of the EMP Task Force on National and Homeland Security, who served in the EMP Commission, the House Armed Services Committee, and the Central Intelligence Agency. There's not a bunch of Mickey Mouse guesswork going on here. It's from May 1st, two months ago. The Pentagon is moving the headquarters for the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, back into Cheyenne Mountain near Colorado Springs, Colorado, a decade after having largely vacated the site. Why the return? Because the enormous bunker in the hollowed-out mountain, built to survive a Cold War-era nuclear conflict, can also resist an electromagnetic pulse attack, or EMP. America's military planners recognize the growing threat from an EMP attack by bad actors around the world, in particular, North Korea and Iran. An EMP strike, most likely from the detonation of a nuclear weapon in space, would destroy unprotected military and civilian electronics nationwide, 
blacking out the electric grid and other critical infrastructure for months or years. The staggering human cost of such a catastrophe attack is not difficult to imagine. The primary headquarters for NORAD, which provides early warning and command and control for the defense of the U.S. against nuclear attack, has for a decade been in nearby Peterson Air Force Base. Critical NORAD operations are being moved back into Cheyenne Mountain, and the Pentagon recently awarded a $700 million contract to Raytheon to upgrade electronics through 2020. At an April 7th Pentagon news conference, NORAD Commander Admiral William Gorkney noted that NORAD is going back underground because of the very nature of the way that Cheyenne Mountain is built. It's EMP hardened, he explained, that North Korea now has mobile intercontinental ballistic missiles, the KN-08, armed with nuclear warheads that can strike the U.S. While the KN-08 is inaccurate, it could be used to launch a high-altitude nuclear EMP attack. Admiral Gorkney reassured those at the news conference that the U.S. In def can defend itself from a nuclear missile threat from North Korea or from Iran, quote, if we get our assessment wrong, he said, referring to the current nuclear negotiations. U.S. missile defense, he said, is, quote, able to defend the nation against both those particular threats today. That is true as far as it goes, but only if an attack on the U.S. comes from the northern skies. Former senior Reagan administration officials warned that the U.S. is unprepared to cope with nuclear EMT strikes from North Korea and Iran if their missile's trajectory takes a southern route. We are among those former Reagan officials. We joined William Graham, President Reagan's science advisor and subsequent chairman of the Congressional EMP Commission, and Fritz Ermott, Marth, a former chairman of the National Intelligence Council, in warning in Newsmax in February that Iran should be regarded as already having nuclear missiles capable of making an EMP attack against the U.S., Iran and North Korea have successfully orbited satellites on south polar trajectories that appear to practice evading U.S. missile defenses and at optimum altitudes to make a surprise EMP attack. The U.S. has no ballistic missile early warning radars or ground-based interceptors facing south, and it would be blind to a nuclear warhead orbited as a satellite from a southern trajectory. The missile defense plans were oriented during the Cold War for a northern strike from the Soviet Union, and they have not been adapted for changing threats. The Pentagon was wise to move NORAD communications back into Cheyenne Mountain and to take measures elsewhere to survive an EMP attack. But how are the American people to survive in the event of a year-long nationwide blackout? Tens of millions of Americans would perish from starvation and societal chaos, according to members of the Congressional EMP Commission, which published its last unclassified report in 2008. Yet President Obama has not acted on the EMP Commission's draft executive order to protect national infrastructure that is essential to provide for the common defense. Hardening the national electric grid would cost a few billion dollars, a trivial amount, compared with the loss of electricity and lives following an EMP attack. The U.S. should also deploy one of its existing transportable radars in the Philippines to be the ground-based interceptors at California's Vandenberg Air Force Defense to defend the country against an attack from the south. Congress has also failed to act on the plans of its own EMP commission to protect the electric grid and other civilian infrastructures that depends on a viable electric grid, such as communications, transportation, banking, that are essential to the economy. In recent years, the GRID Act, the SHIELD Act, and the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act have gained bipartisan and even unanimous support in the House, yet they died in the Senate. States are not waiting for Washington to act. Maine and Virginia have enacted legislation and undertaken serious studies to consider how to deal with an EMP attack. Florida's governor and emergency manager are considering executive action to harden their portions of the grid. Colorado legislatures are holding hearings on legislation to protect their citizens. Texas, North Carolina, South Carolina, Indiana, uh, Idaho, and New York have initiatives in various stages to deal with an EMP attack. When ancient Rome could no longer protect its empire from barbarians, cities tried to protect themselves by building walls. Now, Washington, unable or unwilling to protect its people, is making it necessary for states to build their own defenses against the electromagnetic pulse barbarians of the 21st century. Wall Street Journal, May 1st, 2015. Folks were on the cusp of the judgment of God. Just like Egypt, with its hard-hearted Pharaoh, refused to believe God's word. Now, let me tell you what the Bible says that you ought to do about wise preparations for contingencies like this. In fact, it says it twice. 
so that you won't miss it. Both of them are in the book of Proverbs. They're five chapters apart. Proverbs 22.3 and Proverbs 27.12. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. That's Proverbs 22.3. Exact same words in Proverbs 27.12. Uh, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. There are three basic things that we learn out of those verses. Number one, pay attention to what is coming down the road and prepare for it. That's lesson one out of those verses. Pay attention to what is coming down the road and prepare for it. Number two, hiding from impending danger when possible is not only okay, it is commended in both those verses. Hiding from impending danger when possible is not only okay, it is commended. Third lesson, fools keep plowing ahead assuming that it will never happen and as a result they get punished. There are so many Christians that think it will never happen. The prudent foreseeth the evil. You know, the Bible talks a lot about prudence. Do you know what prudence is? Prudence is the practical application of wisdom. There are three words used in Proverbs that you need to understand because they are different, though they are interrelated. Number one, it talks about knowledge. Knowledge is accumulating and categorizing accurate facts. That's knowledge. That's head learning. It is accumulating and categorizing accurate facts. Wisdom is different than knowledge. Wisdom is the ability to see how the facts which you have accumulated and categorized, how those facts fit into your current life decisions. But prudence is different than knowledge and wisdom. Prudence is not just seeing how it works. Prudence is the practical application of wisdom. Where you say, I see how it fits together, I'm going to act on that basis. Just like knowing who Jesus is and what he did is not enough to save you, you have to act on it. You have to trust Christ for your salvation. The same thing is true with prudence. That's the practical application of wisdom. The first thing Proverbs tells you about prudence is you need to get knowledge. Learn something about the relevant possibilities. Don't be an airhead. Don't act like a chicken-headed idiot. Proverbs 13, 16. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. Proverbs 14, 18, the simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. That means you've learned something. You've got your act together. You know how to put it together with wisdom, and then you know how to act on it. Proverbs 18, 15, the heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. The second thing that Proverbs tells you is don't tell everybody your plans. Are you prudent? Are you going to act on what you know and you see how it fits together? Second thing Proverbs tells you is don't tell everybody your plans. In other words, don't bother me, ask me after the service what I'm doing. Let me give you the verse. Proverbs 12, 23. I hope you study Proverbs. There is so much there that will help you live life. I read Proverbs every day and I have done so every day of my life since I was in my early teens. Proverbs 12, 23, a prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. The third thing Proverbs tells you is, know what you are doing, do your research, and don't be deceived by scam artists who are busy selling panic plans. Proverbs 14, 15, the simple believe every word. But the prudent man looketh well to his going. The fourth thing Proverbs teaches about prudence is there are plenty of fools preparing in the wrong way for the coming crisis. And they think they can deceive everybody about what they're doing. Right, like we talk about hoarding gold, which 
then they will, of course, have to use to buy things, and everybody will know they have gold. So they'll want to steal their gold. You know, they think they can trick everybody. That's a fairly stupid approach. Proverbs 14, 8, the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. They think they can trick people. The fifth thing Proverbs teaches is that prudence is when we internalize wisdom so that it can be taught to others. Proverbs 16, 21, the wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. See, provident, provident, prudence is not merely book learning, although you have to start there to get knowledge. It's when your heart becomes wise and when you learn to put your feet into action, the practical application. That's when you can teach others. The sixth thing Proverbs teaches us is that prudence is gained by listening to those who are older and wiser than we are, learning how they failed and how they succeeded in applying wisdom in the past in their own lives. Proverbs 15.5 a fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Listen to those who are older and wiser than you are, how they failed and how they succeeded. You know, I'm so very glad that God gave me a wise father who was not only wise, but he was also prudent. He knew how to apply wisdom to real life situations. He was prudent. You know, I hope I learned some of that from him, and I certainly hope that I've been able to pass some of it on to my own children. The seventh thing Proverbs teaches us is that there is one more category of people who model prudence and from whom a man can learn prudence. Uh, we're not going to take time, but I could go around and say, what's the other category, you know, besides fathers? What's the other category from which you could learn prudence? Proverbs 19.14, house and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Prudent wife. God gave me a prudent wife in Judy. I'm humbled and thankful that he gave me a prudent father, but he also gave me a prudent wife. For more than 40 years, I admired and benefited from her prudence. The way we talk about that here in America is she was level-headed. She had a good head on her shoulders. She knew how to respond in crisis situations without falling apart. She learned how to deal with crisis situations in life in an appropriate manner. But you know, it wasn't always that way. When we first got married, it wasn't that way. We hammered some of those things out together as husband and wife. She grew in prudence, and through her I also think I grew in prudence as iron sharpeneth iron in our relationship. When we were first married, I had to establish a rule. Through our entire marriage, we called it rule number one. And whenever crisis happened and she started to get agitated, I would say rule number one. What was rule number one? Two words long. Rule number one was don't panic. Rule number one is don't panic. That became a regular routine for us. Whenever a crisis would hit, and it often did, I would say rule number one, and things settled down. You know, that's a good rule for girls to learn. It's really a basic and fundamental rule for learning prudence, how to apply wisdom in a crisis situation. You see, if you panic, all the knowledge and all the wisdom you've gained flies out the window. But you know, I didn't make up rule number one. Rule number one is a biblical rule that God has given to Christian women. Did you know that? The Bible actually, it doesn't say rule number one, but it actually gives this command not to panic to women. Christian women, in the context of married life, when they're faced with what seem to be overwhelming circumstances. Let me read it for you. It's out of 1 Peter chapter 3. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that, if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. 
Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. Most girls today, and you know this is true, focus on the externals. How can they be beautiful like such and such a movie star that all the guys are going crazy over? Girls, that's not where it's at. Don't let it be that outward adorning, verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament, now here's the positive side, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Your adorning is not, from God's perspective, is not how you braid your hair, not how you wear gold, not how you wear fancy clothes, but it's the hidden man of the heart, something that doesn't corrupt a meek and quiet spirit. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Now, verse 6, here's our key verse. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, she's given as your illustration. She also did some bad stuff, we know that. But here's the illustration of this principle. Whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and the last phrase, and are not afraid with any amazement. The word translated amazement is the Greek word pitoesis. It's a rare word in the New Testament. It means panic, alarm, or being scared. Most women, except the Amazon warrior types, the sword-swinging Valkyries, most women have a problem with panic and fear. But you see, the passage also explains how wives gain the ability not to panic. They learn to trust God to work through their husbands instead of trying to take things into their own hands. It's a real temptation. A woman sees something horrible about the hacket, she panics, she takes things into her own hands. She doesn't trust God to work through her husband. Did you catch it? For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And that's the context of don't panic. You know, when Sarah tried to take things into her own hand, she gave Hagar, that pretty little Egyptian servant girl, to Abraham, which has resulted in most of the Arab-Israeli conflict today. Of course, it's not all of the Arab-Israeli conflict, because um, not all of it came from Hagar and Ishmael. You remember the narrative about Jacob and Esau. Esau is the father of the Edomites, from whom came King Agag. And they caused major problems for Israel. Haman, who wanted to kill all the Jews in the days of Esther, was a descendant of Agag. Herod the Great was an Edomian Arab, an Arab from Edom, which was where Esau was. Some time ago, I think I showed you all the DVD in prayer meeting, tracing the ancestry of Yasser Arafat back to Esau. Maybe you can taste a little of the pain that comes from panicking and failing to learn and exercise prudence. So marriage is another place and relationship that God designed to teach prudence. Although some people never seem to catch on to the divine program and keep insisting on their own selfish, petty human plans and then fall apart at the seams when their little plans don't work out. Girls, marry a wise, prudent husband. Then learn to trust God to work through your husband to give you leadership. Now back to our text, dealing with the economic crisis plague. That was all for free. I added that. That wasn't in last week. Um, economic crisis plague and prudence, the practical application of wisdom. Here's our question. Do you have a plan to protect your family? If something of this nature occurs before the rapture of the church, are you ready? Remember, you won't have any bank account. Remember, if you hoard gold and silver, as some groups of survivalists recommend, you will be the principal target of murderers and thieves just as soon as you start trying to buy things and they discover that you tried to prepare with precious metals. So let's have some practical application. Usually I wait for the end of the sermon, but since my time's almost up, we're almost to the end of the sermon. We'll have to go on for next week. Practical application. Do you know how to garden or raise something you can eat? 
How about for next year? Not just enough for this year. Do you have seeds that you can plant? Fertilizer? What if it doesn't rain? Now, I joked with Joanne before the service that I was going to mention her in the message. Joanne knows how to raise parrots, which I understand, if cooked right, tastes a good deal like chicken. <laughs> Seriously, you don't have to be a harebrained fanatic to prepare wisely and prudently. But a few obvious warnings. If you have a generator to produce power, how long will your supply of gasoline or natural gas last to run the generator? And have you thought about this? As soon as the roving gangs of bandits see lights in your house or hear the generator running, they'll know that you have a generator and have wisely prepared as a survivalist. Which house do you think they will hit looking for goods and supplies? So what will you do for water, heat in the winter, sewage disposal, everything else that you take for granted for right now? When was the last time you went for a day or a week or a month? without food. You older folks may remember what it was like in Germany and Russia and Poland during World War II. Do you really know how to do things? Remember we talked about knowledge followed by wisdom followed by prudence. Or do you always rely on the lower class of people, quote lower class, to do those things for you and you don't really want to get your hands dirty with those things? If the country goes into this kind of collapse, nobody is going to serve you because paper money will be worthless and everybody will be trying to survive. Bartering and the underground economy will take over with violent men controlling it. Basic necessities will sell, but will also be coveted and stolen. Sex will sell. Will you have the courage to keep your moral purity when you're starving? Slavery will be back on the market. The book of Revelation prophesies it. Are you prudent? Or do you merely assume that the rapture will happen before anything bad happens, like Supreme Court decisions that jerk the rug out from under your religious freedom? If an EMP attack happens, the world will, in fact, enter a time of panic. Fear and chaos, as prophesied in the book of Revelation, will be the reality. There will be widespread rioting, vandalism, looting, stealing with people trying to break into your home to see if you have anything they need. That instability will be the perfect vacuum for the Antichrist to step in and fill as he brings martial law and order. And the world will gladly worship such a man, just as prophesied in the Bible. Remember, the cattle plague judgment on the central driving power source behind all food production in Egypt was the same kind of thing. And for most Americans... Today, money is their God, money and stuff. God says covetousness is idolatry, Colossians 3.5, Ephesians 5.5. 5. God also judged their war machine. We saw that because he killed the horses, but he left 600 for that one final blow where he killed Pharaoh and his chariots at the Red Sea. Jeremiah prophesied a coming judgment against the gods of Egypt. We talked about that. Jesus said the same thing. Paul emphasized the same thing. Many, many passages. We'll not go over them again. But the issue was going back, and God does not want you to go back like Israel wanted to go back to Egypt. God wants the Christian to move ahead. God does not want us to go back. The magicians didn't learn it. They didn't want to lose their jobs. Oh, so much more that was in that message. Hail to the chief. Well, we haven't gotten much of hail going on, and you can see I'm just pushing pages aside here. But there are a few things in the text that I want to mention before I close down, because our time is up. Like the plague of flies, this is obviously another of those plagues that God wanted to emphasize in light of the verses that were given to it, 23 total. So we'll have to continue the message next week. God's message has not changed, although it gets emphatically harder with this plague. But in this plague, we see God begins to reach into the heart of Pharaoh. Did you notice that when we read the text? For the purpose of causing even Pharaoh to fear. Verse 14 said, For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. This is the very first time in all the plagues that God mentions Pharaoh's heart other than the hardening of his heart. This is the first time God mentions that he's reaching into Pharaoh's heart with this plague. It was rolled off Pharaoh's back like water rolls off a duck. 
Pharaoh actually verbalizes what appears to be a confession at the end of this plague. God has reached his heart, but Pharaoh struggles with it and then turns his back on truth that he knows. How many people are there in the world like that today? People that you know, people that you've talked to, people with whom you have shared Christ. We notice the plague is also called a pestilence. Did that strike you as odd, that God called the plague of hail a pestilence? Now, you know, that's the common word for pestilence, but it is never used for any other of the plagues. And it's only used one other time in the book of Exodus in chapter 5, verse 3, where Moses is speaking to Pharaoh, and Moses is afraid that God is going to hit the children of Israel with a pestilence if they don't go into the wilderness and worship him. Chapter 5, 3 says, And they said, to Aaron and Moses, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. That's the same word that was used of the plague of hail in our text this morning in verse 15. I would love to go on. Folks, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to postpone part two of this message until next week. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. It is true. We don't have to rely on reason. We don't have to rely on popular vote. Your word is true from the beginning, from the very first verse, from the very first word of the very first verse. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it is the God who created us and to whom we must give an account and whose word we have and upon whose word we stand. It doesn't matter what five black robe lawyers decide. It doesn't matter what the popular vote of the people decides. What matters is the word of God. And as Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Father, make us a people of courage and conviction, a people of wisdom and knowledge, a people of prudence a people who are unashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Make us a people who have been called out and called by your name. A people who stand for Jesus Christ because he died for us. Take your word as proclaimed this day, Father. Use it in each of our hearts to the glory of your Son, for we pray it in his name. Amen. A hymn that I think will be encouraging in light of this kind of a